wanted to uh, take a moment again to welcome everybody who's joining us for the webinar today. Uh, we're going to spend about 40 to 45 minutes uh, going through some content together. We'll have time at the end for questions. Uh, as much as possible for those that are participating in the live session, uh, please do use that Q&A feature that's a part of the Zoom webinar uh, tool set to ask questions in real time. We are recording today's session. Uh, we will, uh, after uh, roughly about 48 hours of processing time, we'll get this available on our blog uh, so that you can either watch it again or share it with a colleague or a member of your team. And of course, for everyone who's registered, we'll be sending, uh, sending out the recording as well. Uh, a little bit about you know, where we are today and, and what we're hoping to accomplish. Um, I want to acknowledge that, that we have a lot of our clients as, as well as our um, uh, colleagues from industry on, on the line today. And um, each of us is perhaps in a slightly different place, but I think there are some commonalities. Uh, a lot of the initial fires of the, uh, the pandemic, uh, of the prohibition on elective procedures, uh, on forced office closures. A lot of those fires have been put out. Um, we've made difficult decisions about uh, human resources. We've uh, taken a deep dive into our finances. Uh, we've hopefully started communicating with patients about what's transpiring. And um, we're now able to catch our breath a tiny bit and start to um, look to the future, right? To, to stop and reflect on how exactly uh, we emerge from this really unique period, uh, ideally stronger, able to not only recover some of the revenues that were lost in the time that our offices were forced to close, but able to uh, enter a period of time as we go into those summer months um, performing uh, at, or in some cases, as we talk with our clients, we're learning already above uh, our normal capacity so that we can finish, uh, finish the year out strong. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Ryan Miller. I'm the founder and the CEO of Aetna Interactive. And um, while I'm the voice on the line today, I really have to credit my team. A lot of the, the information, the idea, the perspectives that I'll share uh, is uh, directly from the, the 60 amazing men and women that I get to work with every day uh, to help our clients all over North America. And what we're really going to focus on is um, you know, five discrete vignettes, five things that you need to work through uh, as a practice leader, as a marketing leader, to get through what we think is really going to be a, um, a recessionary period when we are able to see patients again, and then into a fairly strong recovery position. Now, we're going to jump right in, uh, in out of respect for time and uh, work through these five things. We'll summarize at the end, and again, don't, don't hesitate to use Q&A if you need me to slow down and, and take a deeper dive on something. You know, the first thing ultimately that I want to make sure each of you does before we get too far into the future is ensure that for your clinic that you're already taking a very clean, clear stance on how you are responding to the crisis and that you're actually getting that message in front of both patients and prospects. Um, you know, the author Diego Torres has a really great quote. And I think we've heard other ideas that are similar to this. You know, if information is the thing that gives us security, it's absence, that's the thing that gives patients doubts, fear, and, and, and ultimately foments panic, right? And, and we want our patients feeling um, both aware and confident enough uh, to find their way back into our practice and also not to be pushed away by us at a period where we can't readily um, invite them through our office doors. Now, my guess is for those of you that are involved in communications with your practice is that you're already hearing a lot of uncertainty, a lot of questions that sound like these, right? The basic ones, are you seeing patients right now? And if not, what about a virtual consultation? If I had a surgery on the books and I, maybe I can't keep it anymore, um, are you going to refund my deposit? And how are you going to address rescheduling, right? Because I think we all know for a lot of you, you already had appointments booked into May and June. You've now got to accommodate uh, patients from March and April. And who gets first dibs on any available appointment slot? What about memberships? A lot of you have loyalty and VIP programs. How are you addressing those needs and answering uh, questions that come from uh, uh, members of those, uh, those programs already? And still other patients who are really connected to the real people inside your practice are wondering what's happening with the staff. Right? And so these and more are representative of the uncertainty that patients are feeling right now and the clarity that you need to bring. Now, what I'm not going to do for you today is tell you the right answers. 
I'm not going to prescribe that you have to refund deposits or that you need to um, adopt a new you know, flexible schedule for the way that you approach patient appointments going forward. But I will tell you that you have to communicate to patients about what you're doing. It needs to be proactive and honest. It needs to be empathetic and aware of what we're all dealing with right now and really be a true reflection of your brand, right? It shouldn't, it shouldn't feel different from how you communicated with your patients uh, before the coronavirus hit. Now, I want to use as an example, I'm going to show you both the good and the bad. I, I've got a great relationship with United Airlines. I fly a lot because of the, the lecturing that I do. Um, I live in a small town in California, and it's one of the few airlines with uh, decent connections out of my town. So uh, say what you will about, about my choice. Uh, it, it, that's my go-to airline. Um, I was actually on the East Coast when all of this broke out. I only returned to California after being uh, stranded out there for about a month uh, this last weekend. And uh, I chose to isolate out there rather than to uh, brave the uh, kind of the initial phases of uncertainty. And um, they were united from the very beginning, very good about proactively telling me, hey, we understand that the world has changed and we are flexing you are free to rebook your flight at any time and there will be no rebooking penalties. And in fact, that was great because I ended up rebooking my flight, uh, I think uh, three different times. When I went to their site, that message was echoed, right? So there was consistency and clarity. Um, we have some really clear instructions on how you need to change or cancel your flights. And sure enough, they had adapted their programming. It was very, very easy for me to alter those flights. And they went so far as to anticipate one of my concerns. So some of you on this call today will be frequent flyers. You know how important status is. And they went ahead and they sent a message out and says, you know, here's something we want to reassure you about. We get it that you're going to have a hard time accumulating status this year because of the prohibitions on, on flying in certain areas. So don't worry. We're extending that status all the way out to January 31, 2022. So great. This is making me feel better. I'm having positive experiences with this brand. Rescheduling has been easy. Um, and as I'll share a little bit later on, uh, they didn't get everything right, but the early messaging was handled really, really well. So what we have to acknowledge right now is we can't just think about um, one form of messaging. To be good leaders, we have to have messaging prepared for at least three distinct phases of operation that are going to come over the next few months. Right now, um, many of us are in areas where there's an enforced uh, shelter at home order. There are prohibitions against uh, non-essential medical procedures, and we are not and cannot actually uh, come in contact with our patients. That will, I think for many of you, we're, we're in contact with our clients who are already fairly confident that be somewhere between May 1 and May 11, that they will be able to see patients while um, safe uh, social distancing orders are observed in uh, some level of staged re-entry, right? That, um, there will be some uh, relaxing as we find in individual markets that uh, hospital capacity is such that uh, it's safe in that region to conduct non-essential medical treatments and visits. And uh, we'll be able to see in, in some metered way, we'll be able to see patients again. And then we'll be back into a stage of full recovery. But as we'll talk about at the very end, that full recovery will probably be a full restoration of normal operations in the middle of a recession. So we need to have anticipated messaging for all of these stages and let's just talk about where we are right now and the, the shelter at home idea now obviously we have a lot of ways we can communicate with patients some will be more efficient than others right we can get an update on our our website right there we can go to our uh, our own homepage url a property we control get very clear messaging all across that site remembering that a lot of people who will find you won't start just on your homepage, right? Their point of entry may be uh, one of your procedure pages inside your site or the contact page, right? Uh, we can email patients. If we've been diligent about getting permission and building a list, we can send proactive notifications there. But what's been really fascinating is all of the major portals that in many cases serve as an intermediary between us and our patients or are simply representative of the patient's preferred communication platform that they've created new tools to allow us to talk about um, what it is that we're doing, how we're reacting right now to COVID. So the idea here is no matter what your message is about what you're doing and how you're responding, that you do need to get the word out there and you need to get it out far and wide. 
Google My Business is a great example because if they um, very often have a question, are you open? Are you, are you seeing patients virtually? Um, Google My Business is a great tool and they've introduced two new features that you can add to your profile just in the last week. One is your COVID-19 info link. So this would be the place where someone would go to get the latest information on how you're addressing COVID-19. The other would be a link to your telehealth program. So if you are actually participating in telemedicine or just offering virtual consultations, whichever it may be, you can link to that information um, from Google My Business and give people access to that information uh, even if they haven't yet made it to your site. Now, I wanna stop there for a second and I want us to go through a little thought exercise together about the complexity of the messaging that we're gonna to have to work with. Uh, for a lot of our clients, especially in the Northeast, uh, we've also seen this fairly um, uh, common among our clients in Canada. Uh, they very generously in some cases, in other cases, um, it was you know, equipment that was commandeered and confiscated from the clinics, um, but many clinics are today without their ventilators. And where that's critical for certain operations, we may have a, a very complicated story to tell when we can start seeing patients again. So imagine the scenario, Mrs. Smith had a, I don't know, a tummy tuck scheduled um, and uh, your office finds itself without, uh, without a ventilator. What is the conversation that you and your staff need to have with Mrs. Smith right now about her expectations about the rescheduling of her, of her surgery if you don't know when you're ever gonna get that equipment back? And um, the reality is, is that that answer is probably gonna come from or through your people. And what we've seen right now as staffs are distributed, uh, offices are trying to learn to operate remotely, is that uh, the people, the staff that remain on board, perhaps aren't getting all of the, the direction and um, they're not getting the help anticipating the kinds of problems and questions they're gonna have to solve. And um, you know, I'll use an example here. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I flew back to California from the East Coast just this last weekend. I was covered in masks and gloves. And um, as I left out of the Newark airport in New Jersey, um, I boarded a flight. I was fortunate to get upgraded. I'm sitting in, in row number one, two feet away from the galley. In front of me are um, two United Airlines employees who are of positive spirits, are having a good time. And I am surrounded in first class by other airline staff. Um, these are, I was guessing, uh, I saw pilots from different airlines. I saw flight attendants, both from United and other airlines. Um, clearly, some of them had relationships with our flight crew because about 45 minutes into the flight, six of them had gathered in the galley about two feet away from me. Not one of them was wearing masks. The only one wearing gloves was the person serving uh, beverages. And uh, they were talking and laughing and touching each other. And uh, I, can't, I can't even begin to tell you how uncomfortable that flight was for me because the staff wasn't really reflecting the sort of conscious and aware brand messaging that I was getting in my emails and in my site experiences uh, from United. And we don't want that kind of thing happening with your brand. So you need to help your team anticipate um, what are the challenges, what are the questions that we're gonna face as we look at some of these things like the re-entry to practice, um, what are the questions and problems we're gonna face, like difficult questions about refunding uh, surgery deposits uh, and that kind of thing for patients who find themselves coming out of COVID um, unemployed or unable to get the coverage for their childcare, their family that they had previously planned for when scheduling their surgery earlier this year. And, and also ensuring that your, your team is able to come back to your brand so that even if you haven't prepared them, they have the awareness, the sensitivity, um, uh, that they are in the right mind to be able to respond to really complicated questions on the fly. So as we talk about getting that word out, um, first and foremost, be sure that you, if you, haven't, if you haven't spent much time with them recently, go back to those core values, dust them off, and make sure that your remaining team knows what they are and what they stand for. Um, ensure that the people who are trying to get answers, that they can find them. And that's probably going to mean that you have a blog post on your site that reflects your current uh, position how you're operating as a business uh, in the face of today's uh, developments that relate to the coronavirus, that there are banners across your site drawing people's attention to that one page where your, your primary answers are met. It might mean that you reflect on and revisit your policies and help your staff anticipate the, key, the communication challenges that are coming down the, down the line. Um, those policies, as I mentioned, might need to be adapted 
and where you're making those adaptations, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be a secret. Go to your website and adapt your policy pages to help um, give people ready access to self-service and to feel more confident about the response and the reaction that you have right now. And finally, of course, taking the time to align your team. All important there. We all want to be playing uh, from the same playbook. So the second section here is a fairly short one. I'll remind everybody on the call that if you have questions about what we're talking about today, uh, to use the Q&A uh, toolbar that's there. Happy to get those questions answered in real time. Uh, where appropriate, we may save them for answering at the end. So what we want to do now is check and reset any of the marketing that may be on autopilot. And um, some of you may or may not be aware that a lot of what we're able to do with digital marketing, we can, um, we can pre-program and then have that run uh, weeks or months into the future. But I actually want to go a couple of years in the past right now. Some of you may not remember a couple of years ago, 2018, Aretha Franklin died and um, hosted at a very, very conservative church. Um, a number of stars were asked to perform in her honor. Ariana Grande was one of those. And uh, following her performance, there was a, a, a fair degree of backlash that she was perhaps not, um, uh, not sensitive in uh, how she chose to dress for the occasion. Now, uh, without getting into a deep conversation about uh, the shaming that happens for such, such silly decisions as this, the reality is that right now, patients are they're watching what you're wearing, right? They're, they're looking to see if you're dressed appropriately for the occasion that we're all experiencing right now. And so the first thing that we want to make sure that you do is take a step, at, step back, whether it's talking with your internal marketing team, the agency that's, that you're working with, and just asking the question, have we checked all the stuff that's scheduled? Maybe it was a blog post that was scheduled to be released. Um, maybe it was social media uh, posts that were scheduled to go out and either paused or retooled those things that would not sound appropriate right now given what we are as a, as, a, as a world, what we're dealing with. And at the same time, we want to take a look at the last things we posted and ensure that they're still the first things we want people to say today. Because I, I don't think this is actually what Douglas Fairbanks meant when he said a man's only as good as his last picture. I would say a clinic is only as good as their last blog post or social media post. So you know, imagine this, uh, you've got a, a new or prospective patient who finds their way to your site because they have free time right now, they're contemplating procedures, and uh, they stumble into your blog, and the last post that they find um, feels just very wrong, given where we all today, where we all are today. Um, I would argue that the last post they find probably right now needs to be a very clear update or message, a post, in fact, that you're updating probably on a weekly basis about how your office is adapting to serving and supporting patients during a time of crisis. So um, check your lasts and make sure that those things are uh, appropriate for where we all are today. So here's that quick checklist to summarize this short section want to replace any of those automated or scheduled marketing activities that may be tone deaf uh, with something that's perhaps uh, more aware and empathetic. At the same time, we want you to go back and uh, look at things like paid search, social ads, make sure that the messaging, the copy, any offers that may be out there are appropriate today. And finally, reviewing those last things that you put out there on the web, your last blog post, your last post on Facebook, your last post on Instagram, um, because we've seen a lot of clinics that, that just shut down fairly quickly and left stuff up there that um, ignored the fact that you're still seeing patients' prospects coming through your site, your social media, even today. So here's the thing. We're getting this a bunch right now from our own clients. We're sharing it not only with our clients, but also with the industry at large. Uh, many of our clinics are asking us, well, what is a COVID-appropriate blog post? What should we be putting out there on social media um, you know, we formed a team internally just to create a series of free tools um, that our clients and partners can use as guides. Um, there's a lot of scary and uncertain things happening right now, and as much as we can make things a little bit easier for you, we're trying. Um, and they are now weekly and sometimes bi-weekly re um, releasing new tools for you to DIY, do it yourself, because obviously a lot of us are concerned right now with uh, managing expenses. 
in creating, I think the last two, the first one was uh, ideas for social posts that were appropriate. The second tool they released was uh, ideas for uh, COVID appropriate blog posts. You can go to at interactive.com forward slash DIY, uh, register there. You'll gain access to uh, the tools that have already been released and it will put you on a list so that as we released each new tool, um, that will come straight into your inbox there. So um, let's take a pivot now. We've, we've dealt with messaging. We've dealt with that look back and making sure we've got a safe platform to build on going forward. The third project we want to uh, start working on is building that pipeline. And you know, it's that, that pipeline of, of both patients and prospects that we can start talking to, that we can market to. Um, I, you know, I say after the pandemic, but I would say probably a more appropriate title for this section is as soon as we can begin treating um, patients again and at some level. Now, I know that for many of us, we really don't like to think about what we do in elective healthcare as sales, but it is. And um, we've probably seen this idea of the sales funnel in a bunch of different formats before. Um, some of you may even heard the, the acronym there on the left side, awareness, interest, decision, action, the ADA model before. Um, and at the start of it, I'm, I'm, you know, with awareness, I'm generally aware that a solution exists, but I may not actively be considering it. Um, as I move into that interest phase, I'm doing more active research and perhaps even requesting consultations in the decision phase. Um, I, I've narrowed myself down to a couple of different options and I'm actively working to decide on a provider or practice to help me with this. And of course, then I become a, a patient or client of your clinic. And right now, it's difficult to work in the bottom of that funnel because we're not able to take those opportunities and help them become our patients. And so where we're working today, and it's, it's really clear, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you some, some strong evidence for why we should be doing this, is we can be um, executing campaign activities that help us to generate leads, to get permission from people to communicate with them, to market with them once this is all over. And in uh, the area of uh, virtual consultations is we can then take those leads, qualify their interest. Um, and in many cases, we hear that daily our clients are booking procedures, um, not to a specific date, but as soon as possible after they can begin to see patients because they're conducting those visits virtually today. Now, what we have to acknowledge because, and I, I think it's something that um, is tough to talk about right now, you know, talking about uh, marketing conversations when we're making tough decisions about our, our staffing and our human resources. Uh, when cash flow is a concern, it can feel insensitive and it's not. I, I have to though acknowledge the, the truth is that when we come out of this, engaged subscribers and followers, people who have connected with you and your brand, who've expressed an interest in your services, who've given you their contact information um, and are willing to receive communications from you, they're gonna be your lifeline when this is all over and done with. And really all that means is we need two different things. We need contact information from them and we need permission. Uh, some of you will have blogs and blogs where people can subscribe to receive content. Now promoting people to subscribe to your blog to receive an automated alert when you release a new post is a form of permission-based marketing. It's a list that you can uh, consider to be an asset when this is said and done. Um, some practices advance to the point already where they're um, doing SMS messaging or text marketing to people and are building text lists. The more people that are on that text list that you can announce, hey, we're seeing patients again, the better position that you're going to be when, when this breaks. The same thing is true, your followers on Facebook, although we have to acknowledge if you're not paying on Facebook today, it can be very difficult for your message to be seen. Uh, and so at the very least, you may have to plan to boost that message. And of course, email marketing. And um, I can't, I can't uh, stress enough how, how valuable email marketing is going to be to you as we come out of this particular, and I, and I would argue as we move through this particular period as well, because think about why you're here. Uh, my guess is that for this webinar and uh, others like it that you're attending right now, that you responded to an email invitation. That, that 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 was the thing that made you aware and catalyzed you to action. And not to diminish the text messaging or what you could do on social media today uh, or the possibility of having followers on your blog, it, it's still perhaps gonna drive the 
uh, broadest reach and the highest response rate that you're going to get. So I get it. I'm teasing email marketing that this is really important. What are you going to do to grow your list? Well, let me give you an example of a campaign that we ran just last week for some of our accounts. Um, it was Easter over the weekend. And uh, we knew that for a number of our accounts right now, we've been tasked specifically to help them grow their email list expressly so that we would have uh, many more patients who we can communicate with on the other side of COVID. So uh, we ran social media ads for the week leading up to Easter, um, stressing that you need to subscribe to our email list because we're running a big contest on Easter Day. And what do we do on Easter Day? Well, we hid graphics, pictures of Easter eggs across their sites and challenged patients who were on the email list to go and find six Easter eggs, send us back the names of the pages where you found them, and uh, in return, one person who found all six eggs would be selected to receive a gift certificate uh, at their, uh, most of them were uh, medical spa, non-surgical services. So, you know, looking at that particular example, the focus there is, well, it's fun, it gives me something to do, it is sensitive to the fact that we are, um, we were at that time, we're celebrating a holiday, but we couldn't do it together. Um, and it really focused on a strong material goal, which is growing that list. Now, there are many ways to grow your email marketing list. That's just one example. I will tell you the one, and this is the thing, this is a great takeaway for all of you to go back and do right away. The one that is most often overlooked that I think is the most critical is capturing subscribers in your office. Right? These are people who have a, a relationship with your business and would, uh, in many cases, welcome news, special offers, promotions, invitations to events directly in their inbox. They certainly would recognize you if they saw you as a from address. Now, the challenge that we face is that uh, um, the way that you get an email address in office most often is on your patient intake forms. Usually it's a patient registration form of some sort. And you've probably had those same patient registration forms in some cases for 10, 20, 30 years. And there is not an option on there to collect permission from that patient to subscribe them to your list. And that's important. If you're in Canada, you have to do that according to the CAN-SPAM laws. In the United States, we have to do that under HIPAA because we cannot use email addresses that are collected for patient care for unsolicited marketing communications unless we get permission. Okay, so you say, no, 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 Ryan, we've, we've looked at our forms already, and in fact, we have an email address collection, and we have an initial, or we have a checkbox that they have to check that says, I give you permission to marketing. Okay, that's great. The next thing you have to ask yourself is, are we getting the emails we collect there off of the office computer, whether it's scheduling software, practice management software, CRM, and getting them onto the software that we use to distribute email marketing communications? And what we find is that very, very often one of those two parts or both of those parts just aren't happening. And that is going to slow both the quality of the emails on the list and the quantity of emails that end up on your subscriber list. Other things you might consider is creating a lead magnet, right? We uh, recently de redeployed, it was something that had already existed. It was a skincare guide. Uh, we did some quick modifications, deployed a, a skincare advice uh, for stay at home skincare and then sent out a communication on social media, uh, advertisements on social media, encouraging people to um, download that. And as they download, they were all given the option to subscribe to the list, right? So we're trading value. I'll give you something that you might be able to use in exchange, you give me permission to market to you in the future. Uh, I already described an example of social contest there with the uh, virtual Easter egg hunt that we conducted. There's many more things that you can do, and the good news is um, we don't have to cover them all here because we've talked about them in the past. Uh, so for those that are interested, when we distribute the recording of the webinar, you don't have to worry about uh, writing it down. Um, although you can find this in our blog, it's also on our YouTube. You'll be able to click the link when we share the PDF of the deck out to you as well. Um, is uh, I think it's about 10 or 12 minutes covering the top 10 ways for you to build your email marketing list. So there's lots and lots of things that you can do to make that list grow. You know, the, the question that we get, uh, I think that dovetails off of this, you know, because I think I gave you two examples there that both involved using social media advertising right now, and we're still very deeply engaged in that for many of our clients, um, is acknowledging that right now there may be more value in the digital marketing. It's not always true. We found in a few places, for example, uh, that search volumes have come down very, very uh, dramatically and pay-per-click advertising, no matter how much or how little you want to spend, there just isn't as much traffic as there was before. Um, but generally speaking, 
what we find right now are two truths. Number one, consumers have a lot more time and they are spending more time uh, on, uh, uh, on social media and they're spending more time searching. Uh, and there are fewer total advertisers in the pool. And uh, those two things, they work in your favor, right? That they're a fairly, I hate to use the word captive audience, but they are. And, um, and there's not as many people that you have to pay to get in front of them. So uh, I think at the end of the day, now may be a very good time, especially look at things like social media advertising. So we've got a, a great question coming in right now about uh, my thoughts on getting more patients to follow on Facebook and on Instagram. Um, they've got a big list internally, over 50,000 for email, um, and they're already getting up the emails, uh, but they're, many of them are not finding us on social media. How do we get the patients involved in social? So um, I'll, I'll share, Renee, the most common thing that we do in that case where we've been super successful on email and we're hoping for a second point of contact on social uh, is to run specifically social campaigns and contests that are only announced on the email list um, that require or involve patients to like, fan, or follow you uh, on those social media channels. Um, there are going to be a fraction of people who, for their own privacy concerns, don't want to associate with an a, a elective medical brand on social media, and that's okay. Uh, but you're asking them to uh, both uh, take an action and to suffer some disruption from you in the future. So be ready to give that patient something in, in, uh, uh, in exchange in order to motivate the behavior that you want. So the bottom line and what this whole section is about, now is the time. Right now, you have the time, you have the resources, you have a captive audience um, to work on growing your subscribers. And that may mean, you know, like we talked about, auditing what's happening internal to your organization and actively investing uh, in some fun promotions uh, or simply communications with invitations to have people subscribe to join you uh, for receiving updates in the future. All right. So let's pivot now and let's talk about other applications of your time. And uh, again, this is the short section, our fifth section, we're gonna be just a little bit longer uh, because luckily for this one, we have a guide for you that can help. So this is really about reflecting on the fact that uh, whether it's just you, uh, you're a, a physician or a practice leader, you're not able to see patients, so you find yourself with extra time right now. Uh, and like I've talked about, you've probably put out the biggest of the early fires that were taking all of your attention in the first two weeks of the crisis, um, or you may have some remaining staff and you're looking for great projects to share with them that can help you uh, be a, in a better position in your market as we come out of COVID. The reality is you could point, you could throw a dart anywhere at uh, the, the diagram that you see on the screen right now. Each one of those is a channel that you can engage in online marketing. And uh, if, if you wanna shout it out loud on the Q&A board, pick one and I can tell you right now, uh, here are a number of things that you can do to help it out. But the point is, all of those projects are there, right? If we, if we look first at your site, what, well, what can we do on our website? Well, uh, the first thing you want to make sure that you do is you get that message out there about how you're reacting to COVID. But now's a great time to, if you're in aesthetic medicine, to post a new before and after photo. Perhaps if you're in ophthalmology practice, to uh, bring a case study out there about a, a, a patient that you've helped with LASIK. Um, if you are a, a fertility clinic, you're going to be talking about your success stories. Um, you can take one of your procedure pages, one of your core service pages, and enhance that copy, um, making it the, the best damn page about that particular service or procedure that's to be found anywhere on the web. That's a great use of your time right now. Right? If we um, start talking about videos and podcasts, well, maybe now's the time that you cut, granted, if you're like me, your hair looks horrible right now, that you cut your teeth with video a little bit more. Uh, you, you never took the time before to break out the tripod, to get comfortable um, filming yourself, to figure out the lighting. Well, now's the time to do that. And if you can develop that skill set, not only can you create content today that's gonna be beneficial, especially on social media, but that's gonna help you be a smarter marketer as we go forward. Now, the good news is I'm not gonna bore you with a uh, hundred different ideas there, um, but we have broken out 12 different projects that uh, we recommend that you engage in to prepare yourself for what comes next. Um, I think it is fair to say, uh, especially if you're listening to the news today, um, right now, and I, I don't have the numbers for Canada for those on the line uh, uh, from our, our neighbor up north, in the US, I think the number right now is approximately one in eight Americans has already filed for unemployment, um, which means that the total number who are unemployed or underemployed is probably significantly higher than that. 
And as we reflect on what's going to happen coming away from this, um, I think it's safe to assume we're not going to return to record unemployment. And so what what we emerge into after the coronavirus um, is going to look and feel different than, uh, say, last summer. So lots of great projects. You can go to edinteractive.com forward slash recession readiness. Um, download the guide. They're structured as, again, 12 different vignettes, projects and activities you can go through with uh, specific suggestions on um, how to use this time wisely. You know, the thing that we have to acknowledge is that you're going to be able to see patients again soon. Um, it probably doesn't feel that way every day, uh, and I don't want to be, um, I don't want to gloss over the reality that when, when you start to see patients again, it's going to be more complicated than it used to be, at least for a while. And um, right now is a time where, uh, whether it's for yourself um, or the remaining members of your team, you can delegate some projects, you can use this time wisely to help um, move the practice to a stronger position uh, as we come out on the other side. Now, as we start talking about planning for recovery, I want to acknowledge we've talked to a lot of our clients right now who uh, were upfront about the fact that, you know, hey, I, I was already booking appointments into May, June, and July. I'm having to take all of my March and April appointments to push them forward. I'm going to be slammed for two months after I'm able to start seeing patients again, if not more. Um, and the reality is, I think that's going to that's gonna be true for many of you. Um, I think we talk a lot about, and we've heard a lot on the news about pent-up demand. I know that some of you have continued to book uh, cases, treatments, as we've gone through using virtual consultations. Um, but all of that said, we've still got some stuff to think about, like what is your reception area? What's it going to look like after COVID-19? Are you going to be busy? Are all of your providers going to be busy? You know, how are you going to navigate if um, you are trying to observe uh, social distancing rules and guidelines as you re-enter practice? And operationally, there's a, a lot to think about there. My guess is, though, um, most of you are, are thinking, how will I recover? What may amount to, if we look at you know, roughly three months for some of you of not being able to see and treat patients, uh, a 25% loss in total revenues for the year, right? How, how am I going to um, work on building what, uh, you know, could be potentially our best summer ever, especially for those of you that uh, commonly see uh, a, a dip in summer months or take you know, some uh, elective practices, take a month off during the summer. I don't know that that's going to be a smart option for clinics today. So one of the things I recommend that you think about is remember, you're, you know, even if you only have a few members of your team remaining, you don't have to do this alone. Um, we developed the moment that the crisis broke, we, we launched a tiger team internally com comprised of people from five different uh, departments within inside, inside of our organization, whose sole job was to develop new resources, new content um, to help our clients self service, right? Because um, there's the need to market and a need to manage costs. Um, we want to make sure that they do it effectively, so let's develop tools to help with that. You're going to have some different issues that you need to tackle. Could you engage a, a small team of experts who are focused on one very specific goal, like um, anticipating all of the challenges we're going to face when we return to practice but have to enforce social distancing and till, still take steps to, to protect or at the very least reassure our patients that it's safe to come into our office. Now, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that I'd share some data here, some evidence that suggests that you know, it is smart to uh, invest energy in marketing and these kinds of innovations right now. And um, it's, it's linked in our COVID resources page. I'll share a link uh, in the blog post when we get this recording out as well. Um, but you can also look it up. It's called Roaring Out of Recession. It was published in Harvard Business Review. It was a year-long study um, coming out of the Great Recession of the businesses who did really poorly and the ones who did really well. And what did the ones who did really well on the other side of recession have in common? And not to, um, uh, not to steal the thunder of the paper, but I think this quote kind of says it all. The, the enterprises that, that cut costs, that were effective about managing um, uh, the cost of operations while still making investments in marketing, in R&D, and in assets, which specifically these are assets that increase their production capacities, 
um, in general, they were able to outperform everybody else after the recession. So what do those three things really translate to for us? It's, it's about you know, marketing, communications, innovation inside the practice, and uh, capacity to see and treat patients uh, going forward. Now, I really want to focus in on the middle one there. We've talked about marketing. Frankly, operational issues is not our expertise. We are a marketing consultancy. Um, but we are already seeing, and we have some thoughts on what's going to be happening as we go to wrap up this fifth session, um, innovations inside of clinics. So um, I'll pause there for a second to catch my breath and just remind you all, the Q&A button on the webinar control panel is the place that you can go to start to drop some questions in. Uh, we'll do our best to get those answered for you, either here in the last section in line or as we close out the session. Um, and remember, this is, this is your time. If you're, if you're struggling with what to do um, right now, let's use this time together to make sure that you, uh, you leave this hour with um, both clarity and uh, some strong ideas to uh, uh, keep you moving forward. So one of the big innovations, and I think this is a pretty much a no-brainer, but I'll say it out loud anyway, is uh, virtual appointments and telemedicine. Like many of your clinics, you were you know, already doing this often uh, in the context of treating uh, patients from outside of your immediate area who uh, infrequently came to your office for treatment because they had been referred by someone. So you often maybe did their initial consultation uh, uh, using Skype or Zoom or, or FaceTime. And what we're finding today is uh, two things. Uh, practices are embracing this fairly widely. Uh, that practices are actually getting good at it. And what I'm hearing from my clients is they're not going to stop when this ends because what they're finding is it's uh, often more convenient for them. They have less total downtime for the practice. Um, as long as patients are effectively um, uh, pre-screening, that um, they can have very, very productive initial communications with patients um, leading up to everything, of course, uh, except for things like labs and uh, in the case of ophthalmology, eye exams, things that, that have to happen in person. Uh, questions coming in uh, right now about, as well, what about scheduling apps being added to websites? And the answer is absolutely. You know, self-service and things like digital scheduling were already on the rise before uh, the coronavirus broke out. And what we're finding more and more is that, um, you know, practices are, are having to ask the question, how do I operate on a leaner total budget? If you listen to your recorded calls, a significant number of calls that you receive are scheduling questions. How do I schedule? When can you available? And if that can be made self-service, um, obviously that's the kind of operating efficiency and innovation that's going to make you stronger on the other side. Um, similar, I think, and related to that question is enhanced communication and digital service. Now, remember, um, I would say, and this is a great question for you to ask yourself, is before coronavirus, were you aggressively using things like text messaging or Facebook messaging or direct messaging on Instagram to service patients? The answer uh, for many clinics was no. That thought about it. They maybe were doing a little bit of texting, uh, but mostly it was phone and email. And if you think about how you're operating today, I would bet a large number of you are texting with patients, that you are um, messaging them more often directly on social media applications. And again, the expectation is going to be with patients that you'll keep doing that on the other side. Now, the implication is for clinics that aren't willing, able to adapt to meet patients where they want to talk is that those patients will be likely to choose clinics that are more convenient, right, that, that text them back to confirm appointment as opposed to making them call in to get that done. Um, and that they'll make these, these choices align with convenience and that practices that are reluctant may be left behind. Um, interestingly, we are already seeing that uh, clinics that we've worked with for years who struggle to really find their voice and personality on social media um, and, uh, and were reluctant to get out there and put their face on and, and be fun and friendly, transparent, um, that those same clinics today have, have sort of found their voice. They've gotten comfortable sharing photos of themselves at home and in more casual situations and exposing what's happening uh, in the real world. And they're seeing much more engagement and interaction and success on social media today. Uh, clinics and, and specifically physicians who had aspired to do video but never found the time before realized, damn, this is really pretty easy for me to carve out 20 minutes 
and record a quick video Q&A that we can share on social media. And so what we're going to see is that the bar will be raised in the area of content creation. Now, before I move on, there's a question that just came in at kind of the last minute there about texting using a HIPAA secure method of communication. So um, the great uh, issue here is when we think about HIPAA is what we need to do is take a reasonable measure to protect patient privacy. Um, SMS mes messaging is it generally a fairly secure platform for communi communication. Uh, we want to get the patient's permission, of course, and get that on record that we're allowed to communicate with them in SMS. And then past that, we need to take reasonable measures to secure either the devices or the platforms on which we are managing those text conversations. Many clinics today are using secure platforms where for your office, everything looks and feels like an email. So it's a digital platform. But for the patient, it comes through on their phone like any other text message. So there's lots of great options there. Um, in terms of the questions coming in right now, uh, uh, there's one about the previous section about what's the best um, platform that's being used. And the answer is um, there's a lot of great platforms out there for the video component of a virtual consultation. Uh, we've gone on record in the video that you may have watched previously uh, with an endorsement of doxy.me. Um, we don't have any relationship with them at all. We just uh, tested a bunch of different platforms. Now, what we had heard is shortly after making that recommendations, others had made the same recommendations because it's a free service, uh, was that they had some early hiccups right as there was a big up, upswing in the adoption of their technology. Um, what we've heard since is that the platform has been stable and reliable. It's easy to use. Um, and a lot of our clients are now using Doxy. Um, Zoom certainly works. Zoom has a, um, a HIPAA compliant option. Uh, FaceTime, I, you know, there's uh, the challenge there, which is Apple will not sign. For those of you in the, the U.S. that are HIPAA uh, covered, Apple won't sign a BAA. Um, and so while you might get away with it for a while, I don't think it's the best long-term solution. There's also the problem with FaceTime, which is that if the, the, client, the client has another type of device that's not an iPhone, it's going to be hard for you to connect with them. So um, great question there. We're seeing a lot of innovations in CRM, and um, this makes a lot of sense right now. Clinics that were flush with patient opportunity uh, you know, at the end of last year, as we enter a recession, are thinking, damn, I, I wish I had done a better job of staying in touch with the people who contacted me, but did not convert to a new patient, didn't uh, you know, become a new patient in our clinic right away. I better go and try to find those old contacts. And if you weren't good about retaining that information, noting the patient's interest, recording your last communication, and what was the disposition of that interaction, um, it can be, it can leave you in a tough position right now because you don't have that rich pipeline um, of uh, both leads and data about the leads to help you refill the calendar for your clinic once that initial backlog uh, is addressed. So what we're seeing today is we're getting lots of questions from our clients about not just the practice management software, but where they need to be investing and what might be the best platform for them uh, to engage in tracking opportunities, not just confirmed patient appointments. Now, let me pause here for a second because we're getting close to the end. I've got just a few more points to make. Uh, please do keep those questions coming in. Um, the reality that we have to face is some of your community is going to come through this and be in a great position. Um, if they, you know, they were infected with the coronavirus, uh, they're healthy now, uh, they were maybe able to remote work, so their income was unimpacted, they jump right back into their job, and um, you know, they're ready to go, right? There's that pent-up demand that we're talking about. But there's also going to be a segment of, of your community that um, uh, maybe lost a member of their family to coronavirus, that um, is emotionally in a, in a very distressed place. They may not have been employed during this period. They may not have a job that they're going back into. And so um, as we think about messaging after in our activities after the, the coronavirus, I say after, it's probably going to be with us going forward. It could very much you know, end up being an, an, another flu variant that we have to deal with every year. Um, I, I think what I mean more specifically is after we are able to again start seeing patients, the population isn't going to be the same. And so our, our messaging, our offers need to be um, mindful that there will be a, a, a group of people
people out there who are um, not just looking for a deal, but needing a great value to be able to do to do business with us. So, you know, we've all, had, you know, businesses, businesses have access to different kinds of stimulus packages designed to help us get through this and to keep our teams employed. Um, but we're going to see, it's inevitable, um, we're going to see people hitting the market with deals. And smart clinics aren't going to necessarily just discount, but they're going to look at stimulus packages for patients, value-driven bundling of services, uh, prepayment or pre-purchase of services and VIP loyalty programs to shift the conversation away from just a discount and instead to a deeper investment in the partnership that you have between uh, that patient and your clinic. Now, we, we got a, a question really quickly about um, what CRM to use, and I'll take a second before I close out this section to speak to that question because we were just talking about CRM. Um, the first thing that I want to recognize is that if you already have practice management software, the way that we recommend that you tackle the, the CRM selection challenge is to ask your practice management software which CRM systems they interface with. The reason why this is important is one of the investments or one of the objectives that you want to be met by an investment in CRM is that you become more efficient and there is less double entry or manual entry of data. And in a perfect world, your website will talk to the CRM, automatically feeding leans and inquiries into the CRM system. And then when those inquiries become opportunities and the opportunities become patients, your CRM will talk to your practice management and scheduling software. And so if you are deeply committed to a specific practice managing, management and scheduling system, it's a smart idea to choose a CRM platform that already works with that software so that you get one of the big values that comes with CRM deployments, which is this efficiency of, of data entry and data management. Um, and so that's the first place that I recommend that you go. We do a lot of work with my med leads. We do a lot of work with solution reach for our larger clients and group practices. We do lots of integration with Salesforce. Um, and like most software, you get out what you put into it. So if you are going to deploy, um, uh, CRM, Lauren, you really need to be thinking about what's the appropriate investment, not just in the initial deployment, but in the training uh, with, uh, with your team and the integration with your other software and platforms. So let's sum this section up and then uh, we'll save a couple minutes here at the end for other questions that you may have. Feel free to start dropping those in. But as you're preparing for you know, what comes next, right? Being able to see patients working through a broader recovery during a time of recession, I do recommend uh, for clinic leaders that if you've got, even if it's not members of your team, maybe involve colleagues or family members, get a team together to help you tackle some of these challenges to anticipate and brainstorm how you're going to address them um, as you move through this period of uh, kind of a staged reentry, being able to practice. Um, you do need to maintain informed investments, smart investments in marketing that are in tune with what you can accomplish right now. Right now, you really can grow that pipeline of people who are giving you permission to market to and communicate with them. Um, and you need to invest in innovation, right? So that you have the best chance of beating the odds of a recession. Um, I've given you just a few ideas here. You're gonna have lots of ideas of your own. You know, and at the end of the day, my sincere hope guys is um, that, the, I guess my spirit, the reason why I'm doing this with you right now is um, I want to play some small part in helping you feel confident and building that game plan of navigating really the next 90 days. And hopefully you feel a little bit more, uh, you've got some new ideas to structure your thoughts, your projects, um, and the application of your time and investments um, that you've got a game plan for how you're going to navigate forward. So let's sum those things up and we'll, we'll take any questions that, uh, that you have as we, as we close out today. Um, you need to take a stance. Go back to your values and get some proactive messaging out there um, about how you're responding to the coronavirus today and really take the time to commit to updating that um, as we go forward and into the future. In addition to that, you want to check and reset any old or automated marketing. Look at the last post that you put on your blog and social media and um, assure that you're, you're dressed for the occasion that we're in right now and that um, patients, should they encounter your last messages as their first impression of your business, are not going to be put off. 
you want to build that pipeline. Now is the time to invest in ensuring that you have the permission and the system set up to communicate with your past patients and that you're actively building connections with prospects, not to sell them a consultation or a procedure today, um, but instead to get their contact information and permission to market to them in the near future. Um, use this time to strengthen your online presence overall. Remember we offered that, uh, that guide with 12 activities that you can use um, to benefit you and your practice uh, to really DIY some activities in your marketing, your site enhancement and preparation for what comes next. And now's the time to look forward and build the plan, anticipate what's gonna go wrong, anticipate the needs of your patients and your team and uh, put together the pieces that are going to allow you to re-enter strong and stay busy um, when we get to the other side. So um, I've got a, a, some great feedback, guys. Thank you very much for the, the private messages and chat. I appreciate that very much. Um, if we have any other questions, let's uh, get those dropped into the Q&A and we'll address those for you today. Um, otherwise, I'll just uh, invite all of you, um, if you haven't already, obviously subscribe to our newsletter, if you were past an invitation to today's webinar, uh, you can visit us there. And you, of course, are always welcome to email me personally, even if you're not a client, I'll do my best to uh, connect you with the other professionals in the industry or resources that can help you through, uh, through the next couple of months. Uh, to everyone who's out there, please uh, stay well, uh, stay optimistic, and uh, this is a... Um, you know, this is a strange time that we're in, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's going to pass. And we'll be back in front of our patients, uh, back together with our teams again very, very soon. So to everyone uh, wishing you a great day, we'll go ahead and we'll end the recording for right now. And it oh, looks like actually we do have one quick question coming in right now. Uh, let's see here. Reading past the preamble. Uh, struggling with feeling tone deaf. Um, as we start to reopen, um, especially on social media, striking the balance between talking about COVID-related topics, um, educating patients, how do we deal with the potential backlash on topics? Um, so for those of you that are um, struggling with that, go to edninteractive.com forward slash DIY, uh, fill out that little form there, and you can download the last two guides with um, some suggestions for both social media posts uh, and for posts on uh, your blog. Um, there are some very empathetic and aware suggestions that are available in both those documents. Um, you've likely already thought of some of them, and um, you know it's an opportunity really to uh, maybe expand with just a few new and novel ideas that are gonna fill things up. Um, but you're right, be aware that active promotion of elective procedures, that this may not be the time to do it, um, but uh, deep education about uh, what you do and uh, the, the patients that you serve will probably be fairly well received um, as long as it's not uh, a carefully masked pitch for something that you just want to sell. So, um, you know, I really appreciate uh, everybody's questions today and the hour that we took together. Um, the contact information is there on your screen. Uh, everybody, uh, everybody stay strong and stay positive, and uh, we'll see you again soon.